Ruby Life Pools is back for Season 4 of Dragonfly M+, and this guide offers a concise refresher on three things. Number one, it compiles all the tech and tricks still usable in Season 4, and if Blizzard fixes any of these in the future, I will note it in the pinned comment. For better clarity, I will reuse relevant footage from my previous 1 minute M plus tip videos. Number two, I'll recap the most dangerous boss and mob mechanics of the dungeons that will break your key, as well as the tips on how to handle them. This is based on running this dungeon countless times in previous season 1 of Dragonflight as well as on the PTR. Number three, any big changes or reworks to abilities from season 1 will be highlighted as well. This video is meant to be a refresher, not the usual in-depth masterclass guide you see on my channel for M+. The masterclass guide for Ruby Life Pools you see on screen remains 99% relevant as Blizzard has mainly made minor adjustments only to abilities. If you're totally new to the dungeon, I recommend pausing this video and watching the masterclass guide first. Link is in the description. Before you dive back into this video for the more advanced tech and tips for Season 4. Let's get started. The first tech to cover is how do you skip the dragon flame garlet over here. The reason why people don't do flame garlet on high keys is because this dragon is way harder to do than the thunderhead dragon on the same level. There's generally two ways to skip it. Number one, you have some for a rogue shroud that can shroud you through this section over here towards the left. And the reason why you want to shroud over to the left, if you watch my cursor, through these bushes, between this tree and this pillar over here, because this mob can be proxy aggro. So if you have a rogue, you can actually shroud a hug left and go over here. You might be asking, wait, why don't you just shroud through like that? That's because the dragon sees invis, so there's a no-go. So you shroud through the left, or you can use a mind sooth from your priest on these shock casters and basically squeeze in between the gap. The other way to skip the flame dragon is more primitive. So in the footage here, what I'm showing you is we have just defeated a elemental pack. And essentially, I'm just waiting for Flame Garlet to take off. If you don't know, Flame Garlet will basically patrol around the arena. The moment Flame Garlet takes off and flies away, I basically bring everyone, run towards the fire elemental. I basically run in and basically move all of the mobs onto the stairs, and you need to kick the cinder weavers in so, you know, they will eventually move in. Now, Flame Garlet will do his patrol, and you can see he just flew by the screen, right? Now, once you've gotten all the mobs under control, Flame Garlet will basically land around this pond area, which is why it's important that your entire group moves onto the stairs, after which you can simply hug this right wall and proceed to the boss, skipping Flame Garlet entirely. So the trick is, wait for it to take off, run into the pack, drag them onto the stairs and do the pack there. It's as simple as that. The next tech, some friendly fire trickery that you can use from the mobs onto themselves. You can see what happens here is that the destroyer places a living bomb debuff. Now the person being targeted with living bomb can move in with the debuff and place this orange circle on the casters in the second level of ruby life pools. When the living bomb goes off, it will interrupt whatever hard cast these mobs are doing. So let me play you an example. Watch this flame dancer here as this expires. You can see the flame dancer is basically shot up in the air and you cancel its ability. This is something very important that you need to do in this dungeon really because there's a lot of casters on the second level. So you want to minimize the damage that's coming out onto your group by using this trick. Now the last two tech has got to do with the final boss of Ruby Life Pulse, which probably is one of the two hardest bosses in Ruby Life alongside Blaze Hoof, the second boss. Two very important techs here. The first trick relates to how you drop your flame patches. There's a way to drop them really neatly so they minimize the amount of fires on the platform in phase one. Features a very good week around for doing the final boss of the Ruby Life Pools as you can see in this plus 20 we're doing here. This week aura here shows up on screen and you can see it says edge and it points in the upward direction, the northward direction facing the boss when we were pulling him. And some of you might have already guessed it. It actually is a week aura to tell you where are the winds going to blow next. And if you have that in mind, you will know exactly where to drop the puddles or the pools of fire so that it doesn't interfere with the fight. Most of you already seen my tip on this channel where you tank the boss between these two pillars to force the dragon to land every time in phase one so you can hit the dragon because we know the dragon is more dangerous than the actual boss itself. But if you combine it with this weak aura that you can see that this rogue is running out to drop you know, the puddles, it means that the next wind will blow towards the north direction and you can see it happening right now as the winds are about to blow in here. You can see it starts blowing north and it says that the next one will blow from right to left. So if you were smart, the next puddle should have been dropped, you know, to the left of this pillar so that you'll be blown off to the side. So you can strategically place your puddle so that it doesn't interfere with your group. And I'll show you 
um, you know, the winds of change here, just to kind of show you that the weak rod actually works. And you will also notice a pattern here. The fires and the winds, they are not random, right? So it blew from south to north and then from east to west. Basically, it's going in a counterclockwise direction. The next one is from north to south towards the entrance, right? So the next guy needs to place his puddles closer towards the entrance. So it gets blown to the entrance and doesn't interfere with anyone at all. All these little tips, as you can see, the winds are now blowing from north to south. So all these little tips are basically helping you optimize phase one that makes phase two way easier, right? So you can see when we pull the dragon at 42%, um, in phase two, you know, dragon is essentially less than half health already. So do all these fire dropping correctly makes the fight really, really easy. Now, the second trick has got to do with how you ensure that Kriker will always land in a way where you can target the boss in melee in phase one. So this is a negative example. This is what happens when you don't use the tank. The dragon's in mid-air, is on the bridge, the melee DPS can't hit the dragon in phase one. There's a guaranteed way to make sure the dragon always lands on the ground to do his frontal so that you can put in the maximum amount of damage in phase one. And when phase two and the dragon finally lands permanently, you can blow all your cooldowns and kill it even faster. And I'm sure you folks have seen it. Sometimes in phase one, the dragon will land on the side here, flying in mid-air, hovering in mid-air to do his frontals, right? and then makes it very hard for melee to get up time on the boss, more specifically the dragon. The trick here is to actually have your entire group stack in the middle of the platform because how it works is that the dragon tends to do frontals based on your party member's position. So if everyone is positioned near cross, the dragon would always land in phase one to do his frontal. So you can see if everyone is clumped up in the middle of the platform, the dragon will always land and we can get maximum damage on the dragon ignoring the boss, right? So you can chip down the dragon's health before he even lands in phase two. So same key forwarding here, you can see the dragon again lands in the middle, right? This is the second time he lands, we cleave the dragon. Every time, if we all clump in the middle of the room, the dragon will definitely land instead of, you know, flying off to the side. And here I'll show you a negative example. See, we are currently on the side of the room and sometimes the dragon will basically hover in mid-air to breathe fire and melee finds it very hard to hit the dragon without taking substantial risk or maybe there's fire pools there. And that's why if you stack in the middle of the room like what we are doing right now, the dragon would always land in melee range for melees to cleave the dragon. And you can see even before he phases to phase two, we gotten the dragon down to 55% already. Now let's talk about some of the important parts of the dungeon that will break your key potentially all the dangerous things you need to know. And I'll also cover the changes from season one to season four that you need to be aware of, even though it's not really that significant. So usually in season one, if you're doing high keys, nobody pulls this first juggernaut, but I'm in a park, so you know, you do park things, you don't really uh, kind of min-max. And this is only a 20, so um, it's not really a big deal. But anyway, the reason why I want to cover this first pull is because people generally go really, really big over here. And the most important thing is that if you download my season four playter profile, some of these colors and cast will be slightly colored different from my season one profile. So season four is a lot more noticeable. But the most important thing in this first giga pool that generally people do, and I'm doing a punk, so I'm not going too big. But the important thing that you need to stop is this tectonic slam. If you download my season four playter profile, this is basically in a purple shade and it has a voice announcer that says crowd control or CC. You need to stop this ability with a crowd control. You cannot interrupt this, but if this goes off, massive damage on fortified high keys. So make sure to stop that. Other than that, just move out of bed from the juggernaut. And you can see the subsequent next pulls, you also have earth shapers that you need to deal with and crowd control. So that's pretty standard. The other pro tip I can give you is the chill weavers should be kicked as far as possible. These kind of ice bolts, they truck the tank on high keys is pure magical damage. So just watch out for that. The whelps do give 0.15% of count. So what a lot of people do is actually break out a certain amount of whelps on the first floor so that you pull less in the second floor. It's something that people do. Now let's talk about the second juggernaut. The second juggernaut can always be skipped, by the way. So there's a few ways to do it. One is you wait for the juggernaut to patrol all the way to the end. And then what you do is you hunt, right? And they have mind soothed this caster here, but I need it for count. So I basically pulled it. Now this drunk, huh? there's no way to skip this because even if you kind of try and invis shroud or sneak through it. The Drakha sees Invis, if I remember correctly. So this mob is inevitable. You need to pull it. Um, it does a very nasty frontal. Make sure you dodge the frontal. Again, if you have my plater profile, it basically yells at you frontal. So you just need to dodge that. The season four plater profile is in the description. Check the video guide on how to install. Then we have the first boss, which is Chill One Melidrusa. And this boss basically trucks with a magical spam cast of Frigid Shard. 
And it's, it's kind of tricky to do it if you're tank on Tyrannical, make sure you have kind of spaced out your defensive. Um, if you're a prop warrior, you can reflect the frigid chart and that's pretty OP. The chill storm should be dropped away from the group so nobody's influenced by the AOE. The other tip that I'll give you here that causes a lot of groups to wipe is that generally people are very spread out in the arena and they're not baiting the hail bombs properly. So you can see in our group here, we are roughly loose stack, right? So our hail bombs are basically stacked loosely in a certain sector and we just rotate clockwise throughout. The other reason why people die on this boss is the moment Awakened Whelps spawn, which is tons of ads, they are positioned such that they are between the ads and the boss and the tank is nowhere near to pick up the ads in terms of aggro. And they just get meleed to death by the ads because the DPS is just greedy to pad on the ads. So it's something to take note of. You can see once the ads come over here, I position myself to be closest to the whelp so I can grab aggro on them. But it's not foolproof, right? And by the way, if you saw the kick weak aura, that's already fixed. There was this kind of cheese that you can use where you can break the cast instantly and the shield instantly. But Blizzard fixed it. Long story short, don't worry about it. There was a season one tech. It doesn't work for season four. But point is, the tank needs to pick up aggro on the whelps ASAP. Um, if not, you know, you get blown up if you're melee or it just gets healer aggro. So just take note of that. And then after that, the moment the shield is broken, you can see that uh, you are able to kick this frost overload from the boss. Once the shield is broken, shield broken, you can now kick this, right? So make sure you kind of interrupt the boss and you see everyone kicked, which is the right thing to do. Other than that, this boss is pretty straightforward. So that's all for this. Okay, once you fly up from the first boss, most people would turn left. And the reason is because it's always very consistent. This Thunderlord Dragon is near. Now, before you pull the Thunderhead Dragon, or not Thunderlord Dragon, I misspoke earlier, before you pull the Thunderhead Dragon, it's very important that you have your group behind you as a tank. You don't want to have someone walking up the stairs as you engage the Thunderhead. Because as you pull this dragon, one of the biggest cause of death that I've seen Pugs do is it immediately does Storm Breath and it faces, let's say, a Remton party member, right? Imagine that party member is standing at the top of the stairs. The dragon points his breath at the top of the stairs. Some loose straggler who's behind runs up the stairs and gets one shot by the breath. So make sure your group is you know, roughly near you when you're doing this. On Fortified Keys, this Thunderhead does a lot of damage. Firstly, the Thunder, thunder Jaw is a tank buster, right? So as a tank, uh, one little trick that you can do is that if you stand just on the pavement or you stand on this little hill gradient here, which is basically a slope, the knockback wouldn't happen because you somehow just get knocked back against, I guess, grass because of the slope. So you won't fly into Narnia with this Thunder Jaw. That's something to take note of. But if you stand in the open, let's say you stand here, you get flung all the way into the next pack and you aggro those pack and it's probably a wipe. So always have your back against something when you're taking this Thunder Jaw. It's a tank buster, pop something. So I have Ardens here. The other thing to note is that the boss on Fortified Weeks, he puts on a very nasty debuff, Rolling Thunder. You can see Rolling Thunder on these two people. Normally what healers will do is they'll dispel one of them and they'll heal through the other dot. This thing kind of trucks. It's a plus 20 um, and it kind of really hurts. On very high keys, this thing really, really hurts. So you just got to be very careful around it. The Thunder hit is really scary on high Fortified. So just heads up. Uh, you can see this trick here where I'm lodged against the grass. I don't get knocked back at all, right? So that's important. So that's all the tech for this dragon. And then after that, you basically proceed on to probably the hardest part of the trash mob, I would say, is basically with these destroyers. And the reason why this is tricky, especially when Ruby Life Pools was first introduced, there's a lot of spell casting damage from the Cinder Weavers that do their bolts. And this Inferno Blast is a dot that basically ticks on the entire party. Meanwhile, the Cinder Weavers are just doing the thing where they constantly chain cast. And it's random target members, right? Sometimes it goes on the tank, sometimes DPS, sometimes healer. So you just need to be very careful about making sure you interrupt as much as possible. Uh, it's Sanguine Week, so I'm trying to move the Destroyer away from those dudes when they die so it doesn't heal up. But other than that, that's pretty much all the advice I have for these Cinder Weavers. And then the Flame Dancers. These things are dangerous on this level. You never ever want to let the Flame Dancers get their cast off. You see this Flame Dance ability they do. You always want to crowd control to stop them. Again, this is from Season 1. My Season 4 Playtime profile will have color coded this properly. And it comes with a voice announcer that says CC. So um, if you see the purple cast, crowd control, stop it. Never let it finish casting, else it's pretty disastrous because it's party-wide damage. You can see over here, I think you finish casting. You can see this is what happens when it finished casting. Party-wide damage, almost everyone dies. And yeah, bad stuff. Interrupt the cast of Flame Dance with a crowd control is very important. 
other than that, rinse and repeat, you will eventually meet Flame Garlet, like I mentioned in the tip earlier. Skip this dragon if you can. I strongly recommend you skip. And then we have this terrifying boss of Blaze Hoof that a lot of tanks fear on High Tyrannical, and rightly so. Um, this boss is quite frightening in parts, I must say. So the idea here is that you always want to stand near the boss. You want to bait this ad to spawn near the boss. And this ad should have a kick rotation because if you don't, then it will be damaged. Meanwhile, everyone else in the group should bait the meteor. Now, the boss randomly targets someone and drops a meteor in their direction and it will just roll forward. This is like a very finicky mechanic, buggy one. If it hits a pavement, it actually explodes. So generally, you don't want to bait it towards a pavement because let's say he baits it here and it rolls towards this pavement where my cursor is, it will actually explode. So you don't want to bait it too near pavements. It's kind of weird. And by the way, you saw the roaring blaze that we kick interrupted by the chamois. You want to make sure you have a kick rotation. Don't ever let roaring blaze go off. There's a lot of damage to heal already. So just take note of that. Kill the ad ASAP. And then the boss will do searing blows on the tank. This is a tank buster. It's a magical tank buster. It hurts a lot and it stacks as you can see. So make sure you have something big for every searing blows. Healer really needs to watch the tank here and communicate the tank because this thing trucks on high keys. Again, this is only a plus 20, but like higher keys, that thing absolutely demolishes tanks. Um, and it's, it's a fortified weak, so it's not even tyrannical. Anyway, we are baiting the spawn again. So we've agreed to go left over here once the next um, you know, meteor spawns. And that's something we talked about at the start of the dungeon. So you can see we bait the meteors in this direction. Everyone moves out the meteors path. We get ready to kick the ad, kick the ad, kill the ad. Once the ad is about to explode, again, pop, you know, defensive on the searing blow, then get out of the ad's AOE circle and then go further down the path. So that's always clean space for everyone to bait the boulder. So you need to rinse and repeat this entire motion. Always bait the boulder to fly in the direction of where the fire puddles are. So you always keep the front clear of anything. And by the way, baiting boulders onto this bench, the bench will explode the boulder too. So just be very careful where you're baiting. This sometimes just means that you need to pray that you get punks who are aware of their surroundings. That's it. If you can do all these, you're fine. Now, after you get past this first boss, a lot of groups like to do this double pull where they basically run down the stairs and they pull this channeler plus um, all the other mobs on this part, this warriors. That's a lot of damage on fortified weeks, on high fortified weeks. I think I didn't because I felt like, all right, well, someone pulled it for me anyway. But at this point in time, there's a lot of damage because of this lightning storm ability. This lightning storm ability does quite a bit of damage. Now, the good news is one of the changes from season one to season four is they nerfed the damage output of this lightning storm, but I guess on high fortified, it still kind of hurts, but it definitely incentivizes you to pull in the two warriors that was patrolling together with this uh, bunch of mobs. On high fortified, people used to use bloodlust here. If you do not have bloodlust, actually people also get a rope to shroud all the way past the bridge, simply because this you know pack is pretty terrifying, not gonna lie. So just be, be prepared that your cooldowns need to be up when you're doing this difficult pull. Next up, they have these mobs. I think they made a change. Yes, they made a change to the channelers. They made the cooldown on their cast longer. Long story short, it's easier to melee interrupt flash fire. It can be covered by a melee kick now. So that's entirely fine. But in terms of output, you know, no difference. Just make sure you always assign a kick to the channeler. And other than that, these mobs don't do much. All right, when you're pulling this pull, you need to be very careful. So you saw what I did there. I basically interrupted the channeler so I can pull it backwards. The reason why you need to pull it backwards is I've seen this pull done where the tank just tanks them where they are. The problem is you're so close to the mini boss pack that all it takes is just one stray AoE from your party. Someone use some AoE ability and it tanks the thundercloud. Everyone's going to come running to you. So always pull it backwards. That's the trick I learned as a tank uh, that this thing could save you many brick keys, trust me, a lot of hard eggs here. So that's that. Um, and this pool is tricky, right? Once this pool is done, you want to check with your group whether they have cooldowns. Now, if they have cooldowns, you can do the mini boss pack. Everyone feels ready. Your healer doesn't need to drink. If he needs to drink and you need some downtime, you can go and clear all these thundercloud mobs just for more space. They don't give count, but they give more space. So that's just something to keep in mind, but you know, my group is ready to go. So I'm pulling this mini boss. This mini boss have a uh, interesting mechanic that you need to know. Firstly, you need to kick shock blast is really important. Uh, don't ever let it get its cast off. The thundercloud crackling detonation puts this swirlies and you move out of, very important. Also just make sure that, um, you know, you use a cooldown on this lightning storm is really important. And some people make this mistake of actually tagging in more thunderclouds when uh, the boss is basically uh, kind of doing his Tempest Storm Hue. 
And and the, the long story short is, if you tag in the Thundercloud ads when it does its ability where it puts up a shield, it will consume all this shield on enemy mobs nearby. So let me repeat, if you tag in any Thunderclouds on the side to do with this mini boss, it will consume their shield and it will put a giga shield on this mob itself, on the mini boss itself. It's a very bad idea. So don't ever tag mobs in, especially the Thunderclouds. And you want to make sure you focus on breaking the boss's shield. It's really important. Now, if Raivati ever gets that shield off, uh, meaning if you don't break the shield in time, then it's pretty much a wipe because big AoE explosion onto the party. Um, so just be careful. So you can see that it's summoning all these like clouds, right? And then it puts this temper shield. So what happens here is that it's consuming the mobs' shield to put this shield on top of itself, as you can see from the plater indicator that is now kind of with a white overlay, right? You got to break the shield in order for it not to kind of explode on the group. So single target is important here. That's pretty much Rivati. And honestly, with Kriker, we've kind of covered it at the start of this video of the tech. I covered two techs regarding Kriker, right? If you follow those two tags, this boss should be really simple in Season 4. Why? Because in Season 4, they have actually nerfed the Infernal Core damage. So what do I mean? So if you look at this guy, he has the Infernal Core debuff. And essentially, he's taking a lot of damage. And over time, this Kriker's Infernal Core, this debuff, it actually trucks for a fair amount of damage. You can see the DH pretty much is kind of low, even on a 20, right? It's not even tyrannical. But anyway, the thing kind of trucks and um, this is a punk, of course, so it's kind of messy. But just take note that you want to try and pop a defensive on high keys, even though they have nerfed the damage in season four versus season one, it's still pretty terrifying, I think, on high keys. Um, Storm Slam is a tank buster. Always make sure you have a mitigation up and running. And you want to try and burn the dragon ASAP the moment it lands. Usually this is where you pop Lala's and you go ham. And if you can kill the dragon, then everything is fine. Oh, one more thing. When the dragon lands, the aggro resets. You can see the boss aggro resets when it jumps on top of the dragon. You need to make sure you have aggro on both. It's just important. So just take note of the aggro reset tanks. Don't get complacent here. And yeah, just watch the frontals and you should be fine. Sometimes you can run through the boss like what I did and I bubbled there for safety. Just take note. Um, you want to try and place the puddles to the side and you always still want to keep track of the directions so you keep the entire space clean. And if you can do that, Ruby Life Pools is essentially a very timeable key. So I wish you luck in Season 4. If you found this guide helpful, make sure to subscribe to this channel. More Season 4 M Plus tips and guides coming. A big thank you to all the Patreon subscribers that you see on screen. Thank you for making all the channel resources possible for everyone to enjoy. You are the real MVP. And if you'd like to support this channel through Patreon, the link is in the description. Last but not least, the video in the middle of the screen will also help you prepare for Season 4. So make sure to check it out. I'll see you in the next video.